What's up guys, welcome back to Wrench Capital. In this training, I'm gonna take you through exactly how to read candlestick charts, whether you have absolutely zero experience, all the way up to being a more advanced trader. Either way, this is either gonna be a learning experience or a great refresher, and then we'll move in later on in the video, no matter how you started, with a little bit more context and experience to put this all together and look at a few actually actionable um, setups or uh, chart patterns that I that I trade typically on a daily basis. All right, let's get started here. So, really quick, candles can be very simple on their own. They start to get more complicated when you start putting everything together. But I think you'll pick it up extremely quickly if we just kind of start with a base and then move into putting them all together. So here's the base, okay? This is what any green candle might look like. All right. Here's how this, this works here. You have terminology time really quick. You have the body. Okay. The body is from there to there. The body is the fat part of the candle. Okay. Just remember that and you'll be set. That goes for both green and red candles. The body is the fat piece. All right. Now these lines up here. Those both on the top and bottom are called wicks. Okay, candle, candle wick, right? It makes sense. Now, that's the terminology. Here's the actual layout of the candles. Let me draw a red one just so we can determine because there's slight variation with red and green, right? On the green candle, the bottom of the body, the fat piece, is the open of that candle. So say this is a five minute bar, and by the way, candle and bar, candlestick, it's all the same thing. I may use them interchangeably. Whenever I'm saying, I'm, I'm talking about the same thing. Okay, someone says a five minute bar, a one minute bar, a, t a 10 minute candle, right? Those are all the same things, just on different time frames. The bottom of the fat piece is the open on a green bar. The top of the fat piece is the close. Okay, so let's say this is a five-minute candle, five-minute bar. The open of that five minutes was down at the bottom of the fat piece, and it ended that five-minute time period at the top of the fat piece. But then what are, the, what are the wicks? Well, look at this. The bottom of the bottom wick is the low, and the top of the top wick is the high. Okay, so the, the high is the highest point that that particular security or stock or whatever you might be trading traded at the highest price that that security traded at during that five minute time frame. The same thing with the low at the bottom wick. That's the lowest price that it traded at during that five minute time frame. Okay. And in between here is the difference between the open and the close. Now, on the red bar, it's very similar, but we have to make a, a little variation. This is still the high. And this is still the low, but it's a red bar now. Okay, so the difference is opposite. The top of the fat piece is the open, and the bottom of the fat piece is the close. This here is the difference between the opening price of that five minute period. Again, we're assuming we're on a five minute chart, or the one minute period if we're on a one minute chart, or the 30 minute period if we're on a 30 minute chart, or the four hour period if we're on a four hour chart. Right? That's the difference from here down to here from the open of that period to the close. And then those wicks just show you any additional movement that took place during that time frame. So it's relatively simple, right? And once you have your foundation, then you can move into a slightly more complicated putting this all together. Okay? But I have always learned by doing not by looking at drawings. So if we look here, this is how I would learn having someone take me through this. So let's do that. This is NVIDIA, okay? Let's look at a couple of bars. By the way, the light gray here is pre-market and when it switches to dark gray or black, that is the opening bell right here. That's the opening bell. Okay, so this is from today on NVIDIA or uh, you know, March 14th, 2024, depending when you're watching this. Let's look at this, this one bar right before the open. If you look here, you can see, and let's actually zoom in a little. 
Okay, right before the open. This bar, this is a five minute chart by the way, so each one of these candles represents five minutes of time. Alright, so you can see here, the, it started at 8.25, ended at 8.30. Five minute, five minute bar, right? That five minute time frame opened here on NVIDIA, down here at uh, 8.95.10. And you can see that, I'm going to move the mouse for a second, you can actually see that up here. Okay, right under where it says 30 minute, if you hover over the candle anywhere, just put your mouse over the candle, depending what what uh, platform you're using. On my platform, it shows the O, right, 895.10. Okay, and if you look at the chart, look at right at the bottom of that fat piece, yeah, that looks right, 895.10, right? The close, we have 896. Go to the top, yep, closed right about 896. Notice how there's no top wick, so it closed at the high. That's something to consider, right? Now the bottom here, if you go to the low of the candle, was 894, looking up at the data, again, under, right, under where it says 4 hour in the upper left. And if we go to the bottom here, yeah, the bottom is right about 894. Now this bigger candle, right, the open, down here, at uh, 895.75, okay? And the close, up here, right at about 901.01. Exactly, not on 101, actually. And then the bottom here, and by the way, if you want to be more accurate, you look at the data points. If I just want to be fast, I look at the candle itself, if I'm not worried about a penny or two. Because you'll notice that if you use your, your cursor on a stock that's in a higher price range, uh, like NVIDIA is, it's kind of difficult to get it just exact. You know, your mouse, you might be a penny or two off. It's more accurate to look at the data in the upper left, but if you want to be quick, I just look at the candle and kind of eyeball it. Now the bottom of this candle, you can see it has kind of large wicks on both the top and bottom. The low here was 892.88, all the way down here. And the high of this bar was 902.59, way up here. Okay, interesting. Now, we go up here. A lot of people will call this style kind of a long-tailed doji, though this is a little bit thicker. Now what's a doji candle? We're going to get to this in a second a little bit more, but just, just for argument's sake. A doji candle is usually a candle that's relatively flat, like essentially nothing happened with a long tail doji, for example. We'll have long tails on both sides, long wicks. Okay, so a wick and a tail is also kind of an interchangeable word. Now, back over here, a lot of people see a long tail doji as somewhat of a reversal candle. Guess what? Then we reversed to the downside. Okay. Not that that's a certainty, of course, every time, but it's interesting to take a look at that. We're going to look at these things later. Red candle. Right? Let's, let's brush up. The open up here, 901.84. Okay. And the close of that candle, 898. Right? The high, where's the high? Right? If you can see it, 902.89. Yep, right up here. And the close on the bottom of that bottom wick. Right, the close was 898. All right, and the low, of course, 897.50. Now, <clears throat> let's look at some reversal candles. All right, here we go. Reversal candles, I think, are important to be able to recognize, and a lot of those are going to be dojis. Now, when I say reversal candle, it tends to be something that people read as a reversal candle. It's never a certainty. Okay, you can have false reversals, right, things like this. But what it does is it shows that it communicates information with you when you're looking at it of what buyers and sellers are really saying. Okay, I think people think about TA and a lot of times, you know, TA, technical analysis charts in general, a little bit backwards. My belief... Right. My belief about TA is that it is entirely a self-fulfilling prophecy. It works because enough people believe that certain patterns or certain things work. And then they make plays based on that information. We're looking purely at psychology here. Okay, It's not the chart does something and then we think, okay, that's going to tell me how to predict the future. What we're really doing here is looking at a chart and saying, what, is the buyers, what are the buyers and sellers communicating with me at this time? 
And how do I think that momentum will change or continue here in the future based on how they're acting? Okay, and or what do I think the psychological outlook is going to be in the time frame of my trade? Right, the shorter, the more psycho psychological things tend to get. The longer term you get, the more fundamental. Right, if you're looking at like five years out in the future, technicals take a back seat, right, and fundamentals lead the way. If you're looking five minutes in the future, fundamentals take a back seat unless you get a huge news story dropping in that five minutes or something. And psychology really takes a front seat. The charts are psychology. Right? That's really, that's, that's really what it is. That's how I like to look at it. And I wouldn't want it any other way other than being a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right? Nothing more, nothing less. So quote-unquote reversal candles. Okay? You have usually three versions. And they're all dojis. You have a long tail doji, as we discussed. Now, this candle, for example, um, you can see here that the open and close is oftentimes very close to each other or on the same penny. On stocks that are cheaper, like $2, you're going to get a lot more true dojis, right? Where the open price was the same as the close price. Those are the candles on your chart that won't be green, they won't be red, they'll be white. Okay, you, every once in a while, I'm sure you see a white candle and, and maybe you're like, I'm not really sure what, what's going on there or what that is. That's a true long tail doji if it has tails at all. Or it could just be a true doji if it has short, short little tails or no tails. Okay, if, it's, if there's no tails, it's usually a case of very low volume because there's really, there's really nothing moving at all. But in this case, we have just a true long tail doji. And maybe up here... You had a high of 205, and down here you had a low of 195. Just make it simple. Okay, very basic. But what makes this a reversal? Candle. Well, if you look, this is more so if we have candles moving higher, big green candles moving higher into that candle. What does that communicate with us? If we have that scenario, assume all of these were green and strong, right? What makes a strong green bar? Well, one that looks like this. Notice how there's no wicks. We opened, we shot higher throughout the time period, and we closed at the high. That's very strong, right? There was almost no seller intervention during that candle, at least that you can visually see utilizing wicks. Of course, there were people selling, most likely, assuming the volume is high. But it was very strong. So if we assume that all of these bars looked like similar to that, and then all of a sudden you get this, what, is that, what does that communicate to us? Well, it communicates to us that the sellers came in, the buyers tried to push it up, and the sellers took it right back down. Okay? Or the sellers took it down first. And then the buyers took it up, right? And then the sellers took it back down, okay? The timing of the way that it went is not necessarily communicated in regular candlestick charts in the way that we, we all typically know and love. But it tells us that at one point, it went upper high to 205, as we stated, and low down to 194, and then settled again at two. It broke the streak of these strong green bars, which oftentimes can signal a bit of a reversal, okay, if you get that, that price action continuing. That's a long tail doji, okay, but there are other forms of dojis. We have a gravestone doji, which looks like this, okay. Now let's assume that we have those same green bar patterns coming in. All these are strong green bars, let's say. And then we get what's called a gravestone doji. There's kind of two reasons for the, for the name. It kind of looks like, I suppose it kind of looks like a gravestone. I've always kind of wondered. It, not so much to me, at least, but, but kind of. They also call it that, at least I like to think so, 
because it typically signals a bearish reversal. That's what it, that's what's being communicated. What's being communicated here is that we had okay four strong green bars, right? And then all of a sudden we had an open here, right here. It pushes higher. The buyers try to take it higher, but the buyers fail, and the sellers take it right back down to where it opened. That did not occur on those bars, did it? Okay, that shows weakness in a time when we haven't seen weakness for a while. And oftentimes what you'll end up seeing is this. Right? Again, it's not, it's not a guarantee, of course. But that oftentimes occurs because simply we're getting that communicated to us through the Gravestone Doji. And not because it's, it's this magical indication, but because it's pure psychology. It's actually what the buyers and sellers are doing. And by the way, it's important to understand that on these, all these chart patterns, or all these reversal candles, or candles in general, the higher the volume on that particular bar, oftentimes the more definitive the movement in the bar is. For example, if we had that same pattern, right? And then all of a sudden you have a gravestone, doji. And let's say the volume looks like this. Okay, you have the highest volume on the gravestone doji. That's the biggest sample size of market participants on that gravestone doji, which is often seen as a sign of weakness following big strength. And the big sample size gives us the data that we want, doesn't it? You had the most amount of sample size coming in and saying, okay, we're going to show some weakness on this candle. A big sample size of buyers came in, tried to push it up, and you had a big sample size of sellers come in and bring it right back down. And oftentimes, again, that will lead right there. Okay? Now, there's one more doji called a dragonfly doji. Okay? Now, what's this? Oftentimes, you'll see this at the tail end of the opposite of what we were just discussing. You have a lot of weakness coming in. Okay? And then all of a sudden, you have the candle open. It pushed lower, trying to recreate what we've already seen, but it gets reversed right back up and closes right where it opened. What does that show us? Well, it shows us that the bulls have stepped in when they didn't previously. Okay, and especially if this dragonfly doji is on higher volume than all of these. That tells us that the sellers who took over on those four previous bars have now kind of been put to rest, at least on this fifth bar, by kind of being shown up by the bulls and closing essentially right where the candle opened. Now, there's can be little variations in these. You can have a little wick up here. This can be longer, right? This can be a little bit red or a little bit green, right? There's little variations, but don't start pushing it too much. Um, you'll start, I think, seeing things that aren't really there um, in truth. And um, it's really important to be honest with yourself when you're looking at all these things to truly try to see what's there and then decide, is it actually there? Okay. Now, let's take a look at actual chart patterns that I trade very frequently. So, let's say we have a market that's moving higher or a stock that's moving higher more specifically. Okay, it's moving higher. And then what you get oftentimes is like little bars. And of course, most of these would have wicks. Okay, but I'm just going to not draw them. You'll have little bars that pull back. Okay, and then kind of hold. And then oftentimes what you'll see is big shoots out of the hole. All right, now a lot of times what this is on intraday, let's say on like a momentum stock, a lot of times what you'll see is that this is on a 9 EMA or something of that nature. Okay, and, and maybe, you know, you would probably have 
this third bar may be testing or the second bar or the fourth bar, okay? And then you get, if I had more room, I'd draw this shooting higher. Okay, that's very common to see. Little pull-ins to the nine EMA, for example, I have found to have a lot more edge on stocks that are in play rather than like big ETFs. Okay, big ETFs, stocks like Apple, things like that, they tend to get pushed around a lot more. There's a lot more algorithmic activity. Humans tend to be a lot more forgiving when you're trading against humans, when you're trying to trade frequently and against little pull-ins like this. But there's one very clear factor that needs to be considered on a pull-in like this. And that is volume. Okay, if volume on this play looked like this, Nope, can't trade that. I can't at least. This is the setup that I would kind of call a low volume pullback, which means that I'm looking for this. Strength on the green bars, and then it dies as it pulls in. Okay, and then ideally, big volume on the pull away. Right, see this candle that comes in, finally tests and pulls away, and then we already discussed that it, it would the way higher up through oftentimes there off that previous high big volume on the pull away is what i'm looking for and then on candles later on as they push higher right that let's again assume that that push higher i don't know i'm out of room to draw now you're looking for big big volume right and then typically as it pulls away as the volume gets higher and higher i'll be tearing out but what this tells us the reason for the low volume that I'm looking for the low volume on the pull and on a low volume little pullback like this, right, is because we're having a much smaller sample size than we got when we were looking at the big volume on the pull away. We're getting a much smaller sample size agreeing that the stock at that particular moment requires a pullback. You have the buyers who are pumping the volume as the stock moved higher, getting exhausted the sellers come in and take it lower slowly, right? But oftentimes, you'll see volume pull in and get become lower. What does that tell us? It tells us that the selling pool is likely quite a bit smaller. The buyers became exhausted. Their volume is no longer even there. And as the volume pulls in on the pull-in, that communicates to me that there's a much smaller sample size saying that this stock belongs pulling in right now. The buyers have to kind of reload, right? Psychologically speaking, we pull into a place where people are more comfortable, perhaps like a nine EMA. And again, oftentimes this might happen quicker over here. And then you get big volume again on the pull away as the trade kind of repeats itself. Very common. I call this a low volume pullback, but really um, when this sets up in the way that I prefer, which is like big volume, two, three, four bars pulling on a low volume back to like a quick little moving average, like a nine EMA, maybe a 20 EMA, and then pulls away on high volume. I call that my breathe and go setup. That's how I have it labeled in my playbook. Breathe and go, right? Takes a little breather. The buyers reload. They take a breath. The sellers are, are there, but the sample size is small. And then the buyers come back and we go. Now, another setup. This is a flat top breakout. Okay, so let's say you have a stock. I'm just going to draw sticks because this one will require a few more uh, handles here. Doing this. Okay. And then we come back up here. And you see we have this little top here. Now, oftentimes, what I will do in a scenario like this is I, and, and maybe, you know, these bars are touching or closer. Maybe you have one little bar that's sticking up. Fine. A little bit of variation is cool. As long as it, it, you're being honest with yourself, what's really there and what's not. Oftentimes what I will do on a setup like this, this requires a fast broker. But oftentimes what I will do is I will set a stop limit buy order like there. Okay. And what that tells me is that, okay, if this, let's say this is five bucks a share, the, the line is five bucks a share. 
I might set a stop limit buy order at 502 as the trigger with a limit of 504 maybe if I like or 503 if I'm trading with smaller size 504 if I'm trading with a little bigger size okay what that does is when this breaks through oftentimes what'll happen is it'll pop and stop out a bunch of shorts and it rips upside through and there's no time to do anything so what happens here if I have this order set is I'll have it set and it'll trigger at 502 and it and it basically tells my broker that I'm not willing to pay more than 504 it'll still try to fill me at the best price it possibly can but it's basically saying I'm willing to pay 502 to 504 ideally as low as possible but I will not pay more than 504 so what happens is when this pops up through five and hits 502 boom my buy order triggers and this might move quickly and it'll fill as many shares as it possibly can between 502 503 and 504 once it's up at 505 and there's no more shares to buy it'll stop filling me whether it got my entire order filled or just partially filled fine ideally i want the whole order filled but sometimes it'll just partial fill if it's moving quickly and then a lot of times what you'll see you'll see a lot of short sellers who are shorting these little tests here they get stopped out because they all had their stops set in the same spot right above that obvious flat top you'll see a lot of buyers who are late to the party buy buy buying as it moves higher right and the stock has a momentary push in buying pressure ripping upside higher and higher and higher and i'm already in because i offloaded that responsibility of filling myself off of my brain because i'm too slow when it rips through it rips before i can even blink i offloaded this responsibility to the computer to the fast broker using a fast broker i think is imperative for setups like this okay very very important that's called a flat top breakout and then oftentimes what you'll see people do on a trade like this is they'll be reading the tape the level two i did a training on that uh, about two weeks ago it's called trading for beginners how to use level two and i'll be watching the ask or the offer and when i see volume start to slow down on that push through then i'll usually quickly just tear myself out okay very very effective trade oh and by the way one more thing i want to show you on this oftentimes what i'll do on a trade like this is i'll set my stop immediately upon getting filled i'll set my stop for like five cents below my entry so my stop will be set like here okay and i'm risking like five cents a share obviously to potentially make 10 15 20 40 cents a share flat top breaks are highly effective but you you got to be fast it is imperative that you're quick on trades like this okay now one more setup i'll share with you guys then we'll move on to something else here so i have a setup that i've been utilizing for for years now literally years and i've been teaching it for three years um in our private wrench capital gold server i'm in there every single day i send my personal scalp setup alerts i send human verified unusual options activity because i'm always keeping track i've been tracking that for also years now well before i ever offered that as a service um i look through a human verify is that option order on that particular stock unusual in any way whether it's dollar amount volume the way it hit the bid ask spread um overall sentiment of the name and this is going against that maybe and then i alert that after i verify that i think it's truly unusual to the group i work with platinum one-on-one -on -one every day you can take a look at that in the pinned comment if you'd like but a very common setup that i alert in there and actually let's do this on an actual chart all right a very common setup that i'll alert on there is a setup that i call the repeat offender setup all right this is a chart that i'll just take, take you through here because this was a setup today this is microsoft and i have found the repeat offender you know not a lot it's very difficult to come across edge on blue chips all right big blue chip stocks like microsoft but i have found that the repeat offender tends to have edge and i have tested it in raging bull markets boring sideways markets where you just want to rip your hair out and big <laughs> tremendous bear markets and i found it to have 
varying edge, but edge in in all of them. Now, it has the best edge in, I would say, bull and bear markets, and it has the least edge, I would say, in sideways markets because you get the least amount of instances is really the problem with, with markets that are going sideways. But it's very simple here. What I look for is perhaps a couple of rejections off of all this is, guys. First of all, all we're looking at in this setup at all is that blue line. That's volume weighted average price. The most crucial intraday indicator because it's very heavily used. Again, I only care what there are eyeballs on. Self-fulfilling prophecy. All right. That blue line is the volume weighted average price. This red line is the two standard deviation band from volume weighted average price. And this green line is the minus two standard deviation band from volume weighted average price. That's it. That's it. Subconscious, self-fulfilling prophecy. The way that I think about trades like this, okay, is that you tend to see stocks pull away, okay? And when it starts to set up, which it doesn't do in every stock every day, by the way, I have to watch between 30 and 60 stocks every single day to find the setups and the blue chips that truly have edge and that I, I'm interested in trading. But when you start to see a setup like this, where it tests, rejects, tests, rejects, tests, rejects, and then makes another test. I am often looking to take the third or fourth, fourth rejection or bounce, by the way. And I do so with usually if I'm trading shares, a tighter ratio, for example, I'll use something like a 15 or 20 cent stop and usually like a 30 cent take profit if the the channel between the level I'm trading it off of and the 20 period EMA is at least 25 cents or on a stock like Microsoft where it's a wider more volatile stock I'll oftentimes do more, something more like a 50 cent stop a 40 or 50 cent stop with like a 75 cent take profit if the distance between in this case what I call volume weighted average price resistance the red line and the 20 EMA is at least 65 cents for a 75 cent take profit. Just so we don't have too much resistance before we get to the take profit, which I have found over time to throw off any, any edge. You start, you start taking trades when for, with a 75 cent take profit and there's a, a 40 cent channel, it starts losing edge and having negative expected value. So this is, this is like, what I think of this as is you have a push and a rubber band snap back. Right, because this is literally, literally, this is the volume weighted average price. Okay, you're pulling away from that rubber band snap. You're pulling away rubber band snap. You're pulling away rubber band snap. And this isn't magic. This is psychology. This is somewhat subconscious. And what you see is the reason that volume weighted average price is so important is because a lot of funds and institutions, they trade based on the volume weighted average price if they're rebalancing for their clients. For example, if you have a fund who wants to take some profit on Microsoft today, for whatever reason, and they start seeing that, okay, Microsoft's pulling away two full standard deviations on the one minute chart from that volume weighted average price, and they start tearing out between one and two standard deviations higher than the volume weighted average price. Guess what they get to do now? The fund. Guess what? This is this is legitimate. Guess what they get to do? They get to type out a nice email to their clients, right? And they get to say, today we trimmed some Microsoft, or they get to tell them in person or however they operate. Today we trimmed some Microsoft one and a half standard deviations higher than the volume weighted average price. We did much better than everyone else today because that's that's what that's what it is. It's the volume weighted average price. They're selling higher than, than that, okay? So you oftentimes start to see, and by the way, this is not 100% win rate, not even close, but I have found it to have edge in the way that I trade it. Test, snapback, test, snapback, okay? And this, in this case, this would be the third test and this would be the fourth test because this was more like a, a grind higher, pullback, and then you get that first sloppy test. I, I don't trade that. I don't like to trade the second test if I can help it. That third and fourth I have found to be the sweet spot. All right, you start getting into the fifth and sixth tests, test. I've traded it, don't get me wrong, but 
the longer you go, I have found the higher the probability of a, of a rip through. <laughs> That's been my experience with the data. So I've kind of honed in on that that third and fourth test um, as kind of my favorite place to trade what I call a repeat offender. And this is just another another candlestick chart pattern um, that I have in my playbook and that and that I found to work. And by the way, I've gone through oh man, probably well I know over a hundred. If I think about it logically, I know it's over a hundred. I have gone and probably more. I have gone through many chart patterns, and my playbook to this day is like ten to fifteen setups. Okay, that I have found through forward testing have statistical edge. Okay, and and most most chart patterns don't. That's just the reality. So it's really interesting. Oh, and by the way, that one that we were talking about, like the low volume pullback. Um. Or something like this. A lot of people would also call this a bull flag. Okay, I like to call it a breathe and go. Um, I never learned it as the bull flag. This was something I, I kind of. You have to understand. I didn't really go about this the most efficient way. I learned everything I could for free. I didn't. I didn't pay any money to learn how to trade. And um, at least when I was learning, I, I never looked into like resources that taught me what, what what's a bull flag. So this is something that I kind of ended up having to learn myself through experience. High volume pull away, lower volume pull in, higher volume rip upside. Taking into consideration that those volume bars. And only was it later that I learned that a lot of people trade this as a bull flag. However, I think I approached this from a psychological perspective, where I think a lot of other people approach this from a technical perspective. And we both kind of came to the same conclusion. But I, I, I really, I prefer to think about this as true price action and volume action actually communicating with me a story of what's really happening here. I'm not just seeing bars on a chart. I'm seeing well, how are the buyers and sellers interacting with this security at this particular time? And what's the psychology behind that? And that communicates with me a story that I can use to say, okay, what's the probability of success on this trade through my stats? What have I found? And what's a realistic expectation of reward? And how much do I have to risk to get that? If the stats work out over time, then you take the trade. And by the way, this isn't something that's being calculated in, in real time. This is something that's being uh, calculated over time. And then in real time, you just have to try to recognize these things to the best of your ability, which you do get better at over time. Okay, and then, and then the idea is that you get good enough where you start having real edge. All right, now, indicators. Okay, what are the best indicators? Well, I'll share with you what I like the best. All right, what I like the best are things that are real and popular. Okay, so let's let's stay here on a, actually, you know what, let's go to NVIDIA. Just to switch it up a little bit here. My favorite indicators, my all time, I think the most important is the volume weighted average price as already discussed. That's again, that blue line because it's real and everybody uses it intraday. But we have to be contextual about this by time frame. All right, the volume weighted average price, I think is the most important indicator we could possibly put on a chart because it's the most utilized, but it's only that on the one minute and the five minute charts intraday. Those are the only two I use it on. But on the one minute chart, for example, I think it's by far the most important because it has by far the most eyeballs. Again, you, whenever I say anything regarding indicators, please keep in your head self-fulfilling prophecy. So why do I like the volume weighted average price? It's measuring something real. It's literally the name is what it's measuring. And every intraday trader that's using a one minute chart or a five minute chart, especially a one minute chart, is using that. So I want to know where that's at because there's a lot of decisions being made around it. Now, next up, on a one-minute chart only, my favorites are the 9 EMA, the 20 EMA, EMA stands for Exponential Moving Average, and the 50 EMA. For example, on this chart, the yellow is the 9, the purple is the 20, that's what I measure 
the channel width off of, by the way, between, let's say I have a re repeat offender setup like we just discussed, off of volume weighted average price support, that green line, the minus two standard deviation band, I want to measure the channel width between there and the 20 EMA, the purple. Okay, And then that white or light gray is the 50 EMA. Now, full, full dis disclaimer, disclosure. EMAs, I, I prefer to use EMAs over SMAs intraday for scalping. But I do not commonly trade EMA pull-ins on blue chips. Again, as discussed, I have found it to have minimal, minimal edge at best because there are, there, there's 95% funds and institutions and algorithms and 5% retail investors and traders, probably less. And when you're dealing with that, with little rebalancing here and there, buys, sells, algorithm games that they play, right? There's too much randomness. And I think a lot of EMAs on blue chips end up being a little bit of fooled by randomness. Where I find EMAs on their own to really, really shine is on in-play stocks. We've gone over this on the channel. Um, I, it's a video from two weeks ago called How to Find the Best Stocks to Day Trade Each Morning. And basically, we're looking for stocks that have elevated relative volume, a fresh news catalyst, a smaller float, okay, not too big of a market cap, is already moving, right? All these things attract real human traders. The algorithms and funds tend to stay away because the market cap of these stocks are a bit smaller. So while there still, of course, are algorithms playing these stocks, the market cap is smaller that they can't put enough capital to use. So it makes less sense for them to try to capitalize on the opportunity. And what you're left with is a stock that's up 30, 50, 100, 300 sometimes percent that makes really, really basic moves and very often makes little pull-ins to like a nine EMA. Like on an upside move, for example, you'll see a really big upside move and little pull-ins on the candlesticks to like that yellow line, that nine EMA all the way up. The yellow line, since it's the fastest moving average, the nine, the shortest time frame, tends to keep up with the stock quite well because it moves quickly behind it. And you see a lot of traders that are gonna say, okay, I'm gonna buy off that nine EMA. So when the stock comes in, it's a lot of humans making moves and a lot of humans, again, self-fulfilling prophecy, psychology, right? Will buy off that 9 EMA. So what it allows me to do is look for little setups like that breathe and go that we discussed earlier. High volume pullaways, low volume dips back to like a 9 EMA. It allows me to take little trades with very minimal risks because if it breaks downside, something has changed and I'm, a, I'm a, like a quick scalper and I, I don't want to, I want to be out. Plenty of trades to take, right? I'm a quick scalper. Something changed. Cut it. Move on. Minimal risk with quite a bit more reward to that risk. It allows larger reward to risk ratios with a pretty decent win rate, even with relatively tight risk. I have found nine EMAs, or really EMAs in general, to really shine on in-play stocks. By the way, in-play stocks, I'm, I'm manually alerting them also to the Wrench Capital Gold server every day. At least on days where they they are there are in play stocks I, I suppose it's not every single day but by far most days um and i think the reason why i wanted to start doing that was because scanners are, are like real-time scanners are very expensive and i think most traders probably it doesn't make sense for them to buy those quite yet so i made it a part an additional benefit to every membership level all the way from gold to platinum um so i'm scanning the markets using all my tools and then finding the ones that I think are gonna attract or, or more so are in, in the moment based on the data I have at hand, are attracting a lot of traders, a lot of human traders. Um, and then I just manually alert those to the group. Uh, again, that's a, that, the same, same thing, link in the pinned comment. Now, aside from the EMAs, volume, again, is, is, is the last most important indicator that I use intraday. Volume is real, volume is raw, volume is data, and volume mixed with a candlestick chart pretty much tells me everything I need to know. 
It's so important. And I used to actually, just full transparency, I used to deny the importance of volume. And in the last few years, I have very, very much so started to take volume seriously, and I've seen the greatest benefits from doing so. I have a much deeper understanding. And, you know, if you guys subscribe to the channel and keep watching, I hope you do. I'll be at this for as long as I can be. You know, tracking the volume is just one of those things. And you'll see over the years that I will never stop learning the same way that you will. I think, I think even some of the best traders that I've ever talked to, no one has claimed that they know all the answers, ever. All of us are just trying to get better each day. That's all this is. Okay, so as I continue to, uh, again, make, make the trainings, and, and I th I'm really enjoying this, so I'm going to continue to do this. And when I say, by the way, as long as I can, I'm talking like decades. <laughs> Ideally, like decades until I... I uh, physically can no longer make videos or uh, I guess trade, but I think part of the reason why trading was so attractive to me to begin with was because it's not something that you have to pull back on at least a little bit by the time you're, you know, 40 or 50. Whereas with a lot of athletics, for example, you can, of course, do them until you're 80, 90. But you have to start pulling back when you're 40, 50, just for safety reasons. You know, you can't go, go all in until you're 80 doing something crazy. But with trading, it's something that, that keeps your mind fresh and you can do as long as your mind is reasonably healthy, um, which is basically forever, as long as you take care of yourself re re reasonably well, right? So you'll notice that I will always continue to learn and always try to get better. And I think if you guys are learning how to trade or at least attempting to, you, I think you'll find yourself with that same mentality that um, you know, in a really real way, I think the, the entire point of life is to have momentum as long as possible. And momentum can be had by, by just constantly learning and, and getting better, or at least trying to get better. And as long as we feel like we're getting a little bit, about, a little bit better each day, um, I think the, the happiness comes a little easier. Right? I think momentum is ultimately, one thing that I've learned is momentum is ultimately a lot more important than the end goal, which in this case is just the way that we measure our performance, which is money. The momentum of getting better is very important. So please, it, you know, even if you're not at your goal yet, this is going to sound like a cliche. This isn't a money lecture. Um, this is more so just like if I could start over, I'd tell myself this. If you're just starting to learn, you're like, well, I just wish I was a, a big whale trader. If you really want to get there, you can. You have decades to do so, even if you're a little bit older, right? But it's really important, I think, to try to enjoy the beginning of the process because you'll look back on that fondly once you do have what you first of all, saw as the point of all this, and then you get that, and then you realize that the point was kind of just trying to get better each day. Um, so, you know, if, if there was one thing I could tell myself at the beginning of all this, it's, it's try to enjoy the process as much as possible, because as long as you're willing to work every day for years and years, it will happen, but there's no reason to look back and say, you know what, I was really unhappy when I was learning how to trade. There's no reason for that, because it's going to take time regardless. So you might as well enjoy the process. At least you can look back on it fondly at that point. Now, longer term indicators, because that was intraday. All right, longer term. Now, what do I classify as longer term? The 30 minute, the four hour and the daily are what I would classify as longer term. The 30 minute here, you'll notice I only have two indicators. Well, three, if you want to include volume. This is the 50, the white line is the 50 simple moving average. The gray line is the uh, 200 day, or st sorry, 200 period, we're on the 30 minute chart. Simple moving average and then volume. All right, the four hour, same deal. 50 period, 200 period, simple moving average and volume. Daily, okay, each, each candlestick rec represents one day. You have the 50 day moving average. Right, it's the 50 period, but we call it the 50 day because now we're on the daily chart where each candle represents one day. The 50 day, the 200 day, and volume. 
You're like, well, what's what's this down here? You lied. That's a, that's another indicator. That's implied volatility. I want to know the implied volatility on each particular security because uh, that tells me a lot about what I need to know as far as trading options on that particular security. Implied volatility, this is for another video, but it, it very heavily influences the pricing of options through the Greek Vega. Okay, if you haven't studied the Greeks and you want to trade options, I encourage you to do so once you get you know, the charting down. But um, please don't ignore Vega or implied volatility. It's the culprit for a lot of options traders, and I think if you do ignore it, you'll find that to be the case. Um, and if you pick it up immediately, I think you'll find yourself to be in a much better position in the same amount of time after you kind of, uh, you know, go through, go through the, the, the paces and really, really figure things out as far as options are concerned. Now, multiple time frame confirmation as far as charts are concerned. So something that I'm always talking about over on the Wrench Capital Charts channel, I do daily uh, analysis, technical analysis on a bunch of different stocks. NVIDIA is actually one that I'm covering every single day right now. We always look through the 30 minute, the four hour, and the daily chart. And what I'm typically looking for is multiple time frame confirmation of a particular story. Okay. So for example here, let's say we have the 200 period moving average sitting right at about 898 here on the 30 minute chart. Well, if let's say we go to the four hour chart and let's say this 50 period was a little bit higher and it was at, you know, 895 to 900. Well, what does that tell me? Now we have both a psychological potential barrier on the 30 minute chart because everyone's watching that particular moving average on the 30 minute chart, a very popular time frame, and everyone's watching this particular moving average on the four hour, a very popular time frame. Now we have two potential psychological barriers in the same five point range on Nvidia. That's multiple time frame confirmation of something to watch out for and be aware of if I'm trading Nvidia a little bit more actively. Okay, and then even more so, if we go to the daily now, and let's say again, just for argument's sake, this this 50 period, let's say, or the 50 day, let's say it was up here and it was right at, you know, 899 or something. Well, all of a sudden things are getting crazy because now we have those three and we have to consider the fourth one of the psychological round number of 900 bucks a share. All right. I think really crucial to uh, always look for multiple time frame confirmation. And the more time frames that you're able to confirm something important on psychological levels, technical levels, and highly utilized psychological self fulfilling prophecy indicators, the more time frames you can line some things up on, typically it adds a little bit of strength with each additional time frame. Okay. And each additional story that you're considering at that same region it tends to add a little bit of strength, make it a little more heavily weighted in your head when you're looking at a chart. All right. Now, to wrap this all up, by the way, I hope you I hope you you've learned a lot thus far. If you have, please subscribe to the channel. I'm going to be uploading these a lot. Different different style of trading trainings, things that I think are very important, basically just giving you everything I know. TA needs to be this is like if you ask me what's the secret to technical analysis? Um, and you said in one sentence, I would tell you, I can do it in one word context. So many people, especially like when I'm looking through comments on the charts channel, the overwhelming majority is really, really doing a great job. But sometimes I, I notice, I think people are losing context, right? Like if I'm looking for a break on a daily chart, let's say above 900 bucks a share on Nvidia, all right? You might see it break for three minutes and then fade. And what, what some people will do is they'll look at that and say, oh, the breakout, yeah, it failed. We broke 900 and then the bears gave up and that new support level failed. Well, in context, was it really a new support level? We're looking at a big macro level on a daily chart and it broke it for three minutes. On a daily chart, I want to see one day minimum, ideally two or three days of confirmation of big levels because it's a daily chart. It's a big, important macro level on a longer time frame. But in the same way, if we're looking at a one minute chart, all right, and we're looking at over here, for example, 
at a 50 EMA. And we're seeing these little bounces off the 50 EMA. I can't look at this and say, okay, I expect this. Oh, did you see that bounce on the 50 EMA on the one minute chart? That thing's going to take us from 905 all the way to 950 because 950 is a technical level on the daily chart. That's not contextual at all. We're, we're mixing hu a huge macro level with a tiny little intraday technical level, a self-fulfilling prophecy psychological level on the intraday one-minute chart. This is highly contextual for someone who's scalping this little pull-in, for example. Not that I necessarily would, but let's say somebody is. This is highly contextual for a scalper on NVIDIA who's looking for you know, little one to five minute trades. This is completely out of context for a long-term investor, especially, and also maybe even more mid or even shorter term swing traders. You know, you might have swing traders looking at the 30 minute, four hour and daily. Long-term investors might just be looking at the daily and the four hour maybe. Scalpers are gonna be looking at the one minute, oftentimes the five minute, I like to have the 30 minute and the daily up to my right, just because I want to know like really the daily, is there some huge level that I'm not aware of that could become contextual intraday because it's a thousand dollars a share and I'm not paying that close of attention. And I, oh, and I look over and we've been rejected off of a thousand three times, right? In the last six months. And I was just about to take a long trade at 994, right? For a pop up through a thousand on a volatile day. Well, I, I need to know because that is contextual. All of a sudden, that becomes contextual to me as a scalper. That, of course, you know, maybe we're talking like like super microcomputer or something that's super volatile as of late. Um, of course, a six point move for a scalp is pretty unrealistic, at least in, in like talk about more of a blue chip stock. But you get the idea. Context is number one. If we ignore the context of what we're looking at, we basically, in my opinion, might as well not even consider the TA at all because it becomes useless to us. Everything must stay contextual. Indicators, right? The time frames, the size of the setups, the volume on those particular setups. And we have to decide when is something out of context for my particular trading style and when is something extremely contextual for my particular trading style. That's the key. Please, please remember that as you, as you move on, um, diving deeper and deeper into TA. Um, listen, hope to see you stick around on the channel. I very much so hope this, this video was helpful to you. Uh, if it was, leave a like. Let me know uh, what you'd like to see more of here in the future, and I'll see you in the next one.